The Owl House is a really good show. It has everything you could want in a YA animation. A vibrant art style, sharply written dialogue, an interesting magical world that manages to be disgusting and beautiful at the same time. It teaches valuable life lessons, like bullies are always dumb, it's okay to be different, reckless youthful optimism is a lot of fun actually, and that studio heads of large corporations wouldn't know a good piece of art if it slapped them in the face with a novelty sex toy. But the thing that makes it really memorable is how relatable its cast of misfit weirdos are, and how they change and adjust themselves to confront the problems they face. Willow, the plant witch, starts out as a literal wallflower, see what I did there? And grows to be a more confident person, capable of expressing her feelings in a more healthy way. I hate making abominations. I hate getting bad grades. Oh, I can't stand this anymore. Uh... These past few months have been weird, but look at all the new memories we have now. Gus grows from a smart but insecure boy into a smart, confident young man. Amity begins the show as a haughty top student, obsessed with success. Willow! Wow, you're so unnoticeable, I almost rolled into ya. <laughs> Hi. Uh, put that away. You're the one that got me in trouble with Principal Bump, and I never get in trouble. Amity Blight, you are in so much tr- <gasps> Cracking under the weight of her mother's expectations. By the end, she's happy, free, and in love. Three things she achieved by rebelling against her oppressors and becoming a better person. Loose the human, of course, starts an optimistic neurodivergent weirdo. Meow meow. It's hideous. Oh, you'll fit right in. And by the end, remains the same. She doesn't change because she shouldn't have to, damn it. Do not underestimate me, Bellas. For I am the good witch loose. Now eat this, sucker! My only weakness! Dying! Loose is cool. Always was. And finding that out is the core message of the whole story. No more weirdness! <laughs> that doesn't count, right? Much of the discourse around how good the show is, like every piece of media these days, focuses on the shipping aspect of the show. That the show is not only quite romantic, but also unashamedly queer, was certainly one of the things that drew me to it at first. Look, goodbye rep is hard to find, guys, even today. The fact the show made it feel so normal and sweet is genuinely... something I wish I'd had growing up, you know? It's quite natural for the audiences of mostly young queer Zoomers to glom onto this aspect of the show, and I can't blame them for making Lumity the focus of fan art, analysis, comic dubs, and all the fluffy fanfics that follow around it. However, in all our gay squeeing about the ships, I feel the fans of the show might have let something slip by them. The show's much more subtle focus on neurodivergence. Here. It's well known, and stated by the creator herself, that Luce was supposed to be neurodivergent, specifically with ADHD. ADHD is one of those misapplied mental health labels that gets abused constantly, so let's clear up what we generally mean when we say ADHD. ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is born of a group of maladaptive cognitive processes that come in a kind of spectrum between three rough types. For the person on the ground, ADHD is a combination of inattentive traits, such as distractibility, poor working memory, difficulty concentrating, etc., and hyperactive traits, such as impulsivity, impatience, and excessive social interaction. If you have some, none, or some of none of these symptoms, you might have ADHD. Yeah, it's a broad descriptor for something we understand a lot less than we really should, but if it impacts your ability to get by, it's worth trying to understand it as much as we can regardless. The three rough types of ADHD, I, H, and C, are based around these groups of traits and where you feel most impaired will determine to some degree the challenges you face. Obviously, it's more complicated than that, but for our purposes, this framework should be enough to get us started. Now, the evidence for Luce in particular, having traits of both autism and ADHD, are pretty well laid down from pretty much the opening bell. Oh, that's where the backup snakes were. And what were you going to do with this? That was for the Act 3 closer. Miha, I love your creativity, but it's gotten out of hand. There's a really good YouTube video by Skulltrot that lays out both the evidence for Luce being neurodivergent and how neurodivergence is reflected in the other characters too, but there's one character that's missing from this brilliant think piece. Ida, the Owl Lady herself. Can I offer you a human foot filled with holes? A bar of green human candy? Oh, oh, how about this black shadow box that reflects only sadness? <gasps> from the very beginning, Ida and Luce are shown to have a lot in common. Both of them are outcasts. Both of them rarely filter what they say, both of them are impulsive, they hyperfixate on things and come off as... Not enough adventure for today. 
This is clearly not the PG fantasy world I always dreamed about. So, can you help me get back home? Only if you help me first. <laughs> ah, now come along, human. Difficult to have a conversation with sometimes. The big difference between them, at least when they first meet, is of course their age. Luce is a teenager and Ida is a middle-aged lady. What's not often talked about is how their age affects their perspectives and attitude to the world. If, however, we want to uncover what the Owl House really says about neurodivergence, Ida's older and more complete life story has even more to offer than the arc of the main character. Why? Time is a powerful thing, an unstoppable tide that no matter what we do, can't be overcome. As much as the show rejects the idea that you should let the world force you into a box to change you against your will, if enough time passes without any change at all, you might end up building a box for yourself. This is your chance to escape! Self-doubt is a prison you could never escape from. Stop! You've run out of magic! It's my power, kid. And before you showed up, I spent my whole life wasting it. who pretends to be all cold-hearted, but actually cares a lot. From the very beginning, Luce is bright-eyed and optimistic, with a yearning for adventure that often gets her in way over her head. She wants to prove herself a hero and someone who can be trusted. She wants to do her best at everything she tries, even something most would regard as unimportant, like a book report. I'm gonna wow my teacher's face off with this book report. Mom, you won't have to worry about me ever again. Your book report is why you're in here. Ida, however, is very much the opposite. She's very much the anti-optimist. She's not a pessimist, mind you. But she clearly sees youthful optimism as a dumb perspective. She doesn't break the rules of her society whilst trying to follow them like Luce does. She simply disregards any attempt to control her at all, or any attempt to tell her what to do by anybody. Whether it be the formal coven laws that govern the Boiling Isles, or the informal rules of social interaction, Good morning, Ida the Owl Lady. I am ready for my first day of witch apprenticeship. Ugh. Who are you again? Huh? Ida has two modes, either disregard them or break them. The first episode has her running from the law and causing a jailbreak. Not for any important reason, of course, but just to do something small for her friend King. King and I don't have much in this world. We only have each other. Besides, us weirdos have to stick together, you know? Luce is immediately captivated by Ida, so much that despite being terrified and in a world where she doesn't know what any of the rules are, formal or informal, she keeps her ethical compass strong and decides that disregarding the social rules is pretty cool actually. If the rules don't make sense, why follow them, right? Ida, for her part, is largely disinterested in Luce and considered her a curiosity at best and kind of an annoyance at worst. Like Luce, she can't fit into this society, but unlike Luce, she has had decades more experience of society telling her it isn't worth the effort. Ida the Owl Lady, you are wanted for misuse of magic and demonic misdemeanors. You are hereby ordered to come with me to the conformatorium. Would you guys quit following me around? I haven't done squat. Socialization, for those who don't know, is the process of how we as social creatures define ourselves by bouncing off the walls society builds for us. Imagine you are a ball of light in a box made of mirrors. Every beam of light you put out into the world reflects off the walls of society and hits you, giving you feedback about where the walls are and how to not cross them. Now imagine the box is a corridor and you're moving through it. Over time, the light beams begin to affect you, the source, and push you one way or another. This process happens whether we like it or not, but we can control it to a limited degree by changing where the mirrors are, the kind of light we put out, and the kind of response we give when the light comes back and hits us. It's most often described as a growing up thing, but in reality, it's a lifelong process you can never really escape from. For Ida, feedback from all of her actions, the light that she brings into the world, is negative or dismissive or repellent. Wow, Bump was not exaggerating. You were a terrible student. If she does something morally right, the law gets in her way, if she puts in the effort to follow the rules, she fails. Over the decades, this constant stream of negative feedback from society, to behaviour that in her mind is just common sense, could only teach her one thing, that society and pretty much everyone in it are dumb, foolish, immoral even, but certainly not worth her time. 
This is really shocking. I thought there'd be more. <laughs> this is where her seemingly unending well of cynicism comes from. A lifetime of being so different that people avoid you, reject you, or constantly tell you that you're the problem. The only way to protect yourself and stay sane in that situation is to reject society entirely and write it off as something to ignore, poke fun at, or struggle against. Luce and Ida have so much in common in terms of the way they bounce off society, or rather, how society tries to make them bounce in rhythm. But while Luce is almost oblivious to the forces that are trying to box her in, Ida has been dealing with this shit for a lot longer, and it shows. I want to enroll my human Luce at Hexide. And before you get all judgy... That's not a bad idea. You no good... Wait, really? She starts out as bitter, unfiltered, and comes off as a lady who's been alone and disaffected for a very long time. Luce is unknowingly looking into a vision of her own future here, the best she can hope for in a society that wants to box her in and make her conform. Ida is confident, brave, strong, and easy to like, but lonely, disinterested, detached, living off scraps at the edge of society, not even really having a desire to connect with others. I respect your cunning, but I also hate you for it. Seeing herself in Ida is the first step in Luce's journey to rejecting society's attempts to conform her. But for Ida, taking her on as an apprentice is the first step in a different kind of journey. The journey to unravel the cynicism that has crept into her life and put her where she never wanted to be. In a box that stifles who she is and denies her what she really wants. And like any good unraveling, we have to start at the beginning. You can only do that through memorization, repetition, and following the rules. Well, I'm more interested in experimentation, innovation, and uh, laughing at tools, like you! Ha! There's a sociology term called the hidden curriculum. Originally, a Marxist analysis of the education system, it argues that schools teach more than just the content of the lessons themselves. They also teach social rules and norms that affect us throughout our lives. Maybe here I could be your grom queen. That's, uh, not something people usually sign up for. For example, Respect for authority figures such as teachers encourages respect for other authority figures, like the police and politicians. This, it was argued, maintains the adherence and belief in hierarchical structures in our society by socialising you to accept the necessity of hierarchies, even if they feel unjust. One of the big foundations for the eventual creation of Anarchist Catalonia was providing free alternative schooling where behaviour was controlled differently and lessons included a focus on ethical frameworks and why we should adhere to rules and act civilly, rather than teaching them by repetition and punishment. It's an interesting idea that we could talk about for ages, but I wanted to bring up the hidden curriculum to raise a question. Our Grom Queen! Amity. 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 Woo! Get it, Queen! How does it affect the neurodivergent among us as they try to navigate the school system? Children with ADHD struggle in the education system. That's not an opinion, it's a well-known fact that educational psychologists have been grappling with for decades and finding mixed success. While the impairments and how they affect classroom performance are widely known and pretty intuitive to figure out, trouble concentrating, well, that's going to affect your ability to listen in lessons and your ability to write things down. Trouble remembering? Well, taking notes from a lecture is going to be difficult and remembering points for an exam, oh, pff, yeah, forget about it. Hyperactive and struggling to keep from blurting stuff out in lessons? You can go five minutes without setting anything on fire, right? Okay, but why though? Well, that's going to be a one-way ticket out of the classroom in most mainstream schools. And once you've broken one rule, well... The best way to combat these difficulties is naturally disputed. There are benefits to medication and benefits to cognitive therapy. Let's try this. This is a stress toy. Anytime you feel the urge to cause chaos, just squeeze. Perhaps a combination of the two would be best, but then you break into practicality issues such as how costly it would be to intervene so strongly with every ADHD student in the system. I mean, you could argue back that ADHD costs the US education system over $170 billion every 13 years or 100 k per person each in the UK, and that would probably cost a lot less if they just provided... Okay, uh, I'm getting off topic here. Ida's time in the education system is eerily familiar for those who grew up neurodivergent, and especially with ADHD. She doesn't see her mischief as wrong or doing anything malicious exactly. Fill the detention pit with green gelatin. It was his birthday. He liked it. She simply doesn't have time for the rules and doesn't see why following them is a good idea. 
to her, it all seems arbitrary and contrived. Largely because it mostly is. I'm just enforcing school policy. That you added to. Ida isn't immoral, exactly. She has a strong internal sense of ethics, even goes so far as to play along with the rules so that the teacher she likes can keep his job. Nah, I think I'm being used to embarrass our vice principal. But for the most part, the school's desired outcome, making her into a conforming member of society, is at odds with Ida's goal of being free and unbound by society. So she breaks the rules and doesn't see why she should even care about it. What's so bad about breaking the rules anyway? The rules want her to join a coven and limit herself and her powers. That's not an outcome she wants anyway. This path to success through the education system has literally nothing to offer her because of that. There's a myth that ADHD kids are stupid, and ironically that's a very stupid myth. Sure, they might have bad grades at school, but most of the kids with ADHD are actually pretty clever if you sit down and talk to them. No matter how clever they are though, it never really translates into a good grade, because the writing aspects, the concentration aspects, and the memorizing aspects of producing good schoolwork are all impaired compared to other students. However, a pupil with ADHD can be a very quick learner. They will just often learn best verbally, by communication with a social component that makes it easier to remember, easy to flag in your mind. It's a half moon and you're mixing a lead foot potion. What ratio of black rope quills to iron ash do you use? Is it a waning or a waxing moon? Oh, uh, I don't think that matters. Yeah, sure it does. If it's a waxing moon, it's a two to one mix. But if it's a waning, the black root quills lose their oomph and you gotta double down to a four to one. Not the kind of thing you get from a two hour silent exam paper or a textbook. If you're familiar with the social model of disability, the idea that disabled people aren't disabled just by medical conditions, but by the way society has been built for people who were able to say, climb stairs, you could consider ADHD as learning impairment the same way. It's not that they can't learn, it's that schools were not built to teach in the way that they need. This is Luce's experience of schooling too, but it's much more deeply pronounced in Ida, who's gifted and quick to learn, but only if she engages with the topic her way. And because she rejects the hidden curriculum of the school, she is seen as troubled and different from everybody else, a label which she begins to wear proudly. So proudly, in fact, that when she is offered a highly sought after position in society, she gives it to her sister, because her sister genuinely wants it, while Ida never thought of it as worth her time. I've decided the covens aren't really my style. Unfortunately, her sister, struggling with the jealousy that Ida always manages to get by with seemingly so little effort and gets more praise than her at the end of it, decides to act negatively. And so, as soon as Ida leaves school and rejects the offer society gives her, the curse strikes. Suddenly, everything shifts. The Owl Lady is called the Owl Lady for a very specific reason. I'm a sleepy little owl. The curse that was forced upon her by a jealous sister. The Owl Beast that lurks beneath the surface, granting her unique abilities, yes, but also causing her a great deal of fear, pain, and insecurity. The ADHD that Ida used to take so simply as part of her personality is suddenly a huge hindrance to her life, and the curse is a perfect allegory for that. The curse works as an allegory for ADHD in a number of ways. The beast itself represents the outbursts that sometimes happen when neurodivergent people can't express their emotions to someone effectively. Having been on the receiving end and the giving end of these outbursts before, it can be a real struggle to calm someone down and communicate your point to them when this happens. From the giving side, it can be really difficult to stop yourself once it starts. You can even feel like a monster afterwards, so seeing it represented here is close to home. The second part of the allegory is a lot more subtle. Knowing that you are capable of so much damage in such a short time has an inevitable effect on your confidence and your social relationships. I, why should I be calm? I have a right to be upset! Fear and insecurity can make you timid, make you take less risks and, or as in Ida's case, make you isolate yourself from other people, kickstarting a cycle of loneliness that can be very difficult to escape. I'm sorry, Ida. It's over. Are you okay? Is this the curse? Just tell them. Let them help. 
<laughs> it's fine. Everything's normal. While Edith's struggles within the education system are largely told in flashback, her struggles with the curse in her adult life are the main thrust of her arc, and they tell a potent story of not only self-improvement, but of making meaningful change to your self-image for the benefit of something you care about. When we first meet her, Ida has carved a stable system for herself. She uses her specially made elixir to keep the curse in check. Got diagnosed with cool guy syndrome yesterday. <laughs> so now I take Adderall. <laughs> However, she rarely concerns herself with interacting too much with the outside world. She's built an outwardly stable but inwardly strained control over the beast inside. She manages to stay in control of herself as long as everything remains the same. The drawback, of course, is that things around you never remain the same, and once she decides to open up a little to the world by allowing Luce into her life and getting more involved in her wacky adventures, she finds herself more and more in situations that put further strain on her self-control. Ida, do you have kids? Situations that become inevitable when you take on responsibility of looking after a kid. Having a kid as a neurodivergent person can be a huge shock to the system, and I mean that in more ways than one. While it's a huge shock in a physical sense, just having a kid or a teenager in the house can be hugely disruptive to the daily patterns and rhythms that kept you on an even emotional keel day by day. Suddenly, you have to get up earlier. Suddenly, you have to teach people things. Suddenly, you start forgetting to do self-care. The elixir. It isn't working on the curse anymore. This is bad. <coughs> when did I swallow a swing? For Ida, more and more she finds herself losing control of the beast and getting into trouble, her new family having to take drastic steps to bring her back down. Meanwhile, her old family gets pushed further and further away. By the end of season one, Ida seems to be finally losing control of the curse and she worries for a moment if she'll ever be able to bring it under control again. All right, kid, listen to me. I'm going away and I don't know if I can bounce back this time. Watch over, King. Remember to feed Hootie. Please, no! And Luz, thank you for being in my life. But with the help of her new family, and a little sacrifice from Ida's old family literally meeting her halfway... I should have done this a long time ago. With this spell declared, let the pain be shared. The curse recedes for a bit, and Ida finds herself powerless, but in control again. This begins a new phase for Ida. While she still has the curse holding her back and she's now without her magic, she has more control over the beast than ever. She only becomes the beast when her anti-medicine, overbearing mother shows up to inject her unwanted opinions into her daughter's life. Maybe this has something to say about anti-psychiatric sentiments and how they damage family relationships and make everything worse by imposing unhelpful levels of whelming and informal social control. How about that? Yeah, this whole episode is just your mum trying to drag you out of bed during an oppressive episode and make you pretend not to be depressed for their sake by posing you at the dinner table like an action figure. This show hits so close to the mark sometimes, goddamn. While this point in her life seems like a downgrade from the system she had before, it's important to note that she is approaching the curse in a very different way now, not ignoring it or insisting that she's got a handle on it, but trying to overcome it actively, even allowing people to help her when she needs it. This comes to a head in one of the best episodes of the entire show in terms of character development. Wow, I've never had a dream this pretty. Triggered no less by Hootie a Gilbert Gottfried pastiche that walks like a house. Don't let me fall asleep. Yup! One bite will put you to sleep for hours! For hours! For hours! Look, Hootie is intentionally scary and creepy and annoying, but he does care a lot about his friends. And in this episode, he pushes all three of the principal cast into situations that drive men into intense personal growth by confronting their latent anxieties. For King, he discovers new demonic powers by confronting his fear about who he is. Luce finally gets to ask out her longtime crush by confronting her fear of rejection, and Ida. Ida is forced to confront the curse. Head on. The curse forces her to face the pain it has caused her, from alienating her family. To hell! Lilith, call the healing coven! To not being able to express herself to her lover when she needs to. It's fine. Everything's normal. You can leave now. I can't do this anymore. But finally, she manages to forgive the curse for all that it's done, forgiving herself in the process. Listen, neither of us want to be here, but we are, and there's no changing that. If we can't accept each other, this nightmare will never end. So what do you say? Truce? For now? After decades of fighting to suppress it, Ida finally accepts the curse, 
the condition that's caused her so much trouble throughout her life, as a part of herself. Harpy Eater, as well as being a badass new form for her to take, is also a beautiful metaphor for something which I'll try to express to you here. By learning how to use your condition, accepting it, accepting help from others, accepting the steps you'll need to take to become better than you were, and accepting yourself, ADHD, and any neurodivergence really, can become something more than the thing holding you back. It can be the thing that gives you the strength to move forward. It's how impulsivity can become creativity. It's how not having a filter can make you a great friend. It's how frustration at the rules can make you an advocate for justice. Ida knows she can never go back to who she was, but by confronting her past and her present, she can become something new, something that works for her and for the people she cares about. It might take a while to make friends with pain, to shape it into a part of you that helps rather than hurts, but it's possible and it's worth it. The box you build yourself to keep safe from society or to keep society safe from you is often made up of perceptions. Perceptions that scare you into staying still inside the box. But perception is the mother of deception and without the help of other people's perceptions, you might wind up limiting yourself and rejecting the world around you, even if it has something you might really need, like family. Isn't it amazing? We did it. After everything, after all that, we stuck together. Yeah, we did all right. I'll say. There is no cure for ADHD. There is no cure for neurodivergence in general. That's because it's not something that needs to be cured, but something that needs to be learned about and understood if you want to overcome the challenges that it brings. The whole point of the Owl House is that you shouldn't have to change because others tell you. So why do our main characters all change by the end of the show if they're fine just the way they are? Well, because when society tells you to change, it's not trying to make you better, it's trying to make you what it thinks it's better. And you have to decide whether you agree with that or not. But when you decide to change, when you know what you want out of life, it's important to know how to find your way to it, and how to have the courage to do it despite your limitations by overcoming those limitations. By the end of the show, Luce and Ida have both been changed, by the events of the show and of course each other, but the change itself was always on their terms. Luce managed to reconcile her impulsivity with a desire to do the right thing and become a hero. Everything's come full circle, baby! Ida wins her decade-long fight with her inability to let people in and becomes a role model, a mentor, and a mother. And then, like all great anime, it ends with teenagers using the power of friendship to kill God. Which god, you ask? The god they kill isn't just a man who lost his way, as Belos himself pretends to be so many times. The god they kill is society itself, and all the control freaks with a lust for repression that come with it. The authority figure who puts the boot on your neck, and the crippling feel of failure into your mind. They stamp it out, and we get the glimpse of a new world they build in its place. A world where people are free to live without the limitations of a controlling society. A place where, despite the curse, both Ida and her sister are able to be part of the community at large, rather than conformed and unhappy or ostracized and unhappy. And up to the very last lines of the show, its most powerful message shines through. I could try and add analysis to it, but at this point, I don't think I can say it any better than the characters themselves. Oh, look at us loose. King and I don't have much in this world, we only have each other. Besides, us weirdos have to stick together, you know? Weirdos? Weirdos. Weirdos.